In 1780, Luigi Galvani was dissecting some frogs, and he had some frog legs hanging from a brass hook. When he went to touch them with his iron scalpel, he found that they contracted. He thought this electricity was being generated inside the leg, and he referred to it as animal electricity. Now, Alessandro Volta had some different thoughts. Volta had been working with static charge, so he knew that contacting dissimilar materials could result in charge transfer from one to the other. So Volta thought the source of the electricity in Galvani's experiments were the two dissimilar metals. So Volta started to experiment, and in 1794 he took a piece of zinc and a piece of copper, and then he had a piece of paper that he soaked in salt water, and he placed it between the copper and the zinc. And he found that if he made a connection to the zinc and the copper, he could get a continuous flow of electricity. In 1800, Volta took his cell, and then he made several more cells, and he stacked or piled them together, hence the name Voltaic Pile. And what he found was if he made a connection now between the copper and the zinc, he again got a continuous flow of electricity, but a much larger amount of electricity. So essentially he had the first battery. So what we're going to do now is demonstrate how to build one of these voltaic piles, demonstrate its operation, and then explain its operation. I'm actually going to use aluminum instead of zinc, so I have a disc of aluminum and a disc of copper and a piece of paper. And I've prepared a solution of salt water here, so I'm going to soak the paper in the salt water and place it between the aluminum and the copper. And I have a voltmeter here, so I'm going to take the voltmeter and attach it to both ends. And you see I get a reading of about 0.59 volts. So now what I'm going to do is construct a series of these cells and pile them together to form a voltaic pile. And what we'll see is that, just like Volta observed, is that the potentials, the voltages, will add when I stack these in series. So I've made five cells, and I'm going to take these five cells and stack them together. So I have a voltaic pile consisting of five cells. And so now I'm going to take some tape around the edges to hold it together. So now I have my voltaic pile of five cells. And now when I attach the battery to it, I have to change scales even. You see I have almost three volts being generated. So now I'm going to take this and attach it to a light emitting diode. So I've scotch taped two leads to the battery and now I'm going to connect that to a red light emitting diode. And you can see the light emitting diode glowing. So what I've produced here is essentially a battery. Here I have two neutral pieces, one of copper and one of zinc. Now, they're at different electrochemical potentials, and since they're neutral, the difference in electrochemical potential is all chemical. If you put them in contact, there will be a transfer of electrons from the zinc 
to the copper, and that will set up an electrical potential to balance the chemical potential. And so you'll get to where the electrochemical potentials are the same, and the transfer of charge will stop. Now, what Volta did to cause that transfer of charge to be continuous is that he put a salt-soaked piece of cloth or cardboard between. And then what he found was if he made an electrical connection to the zinc and the copper, he could get a continuous flow of current. To explain Volta's cell, let's look at the following. On the left here, we have a zinc electrode, and on the right here, a copper electrode. And we have the electrodes in a beaker holding salt water. Now, in Volta's actual cell, it was a piece of cardboard or cloth between the zinc and copper electrodes that held the salt water, but it's easier to visualize here with a beaker. And then we have the zinc and the copper electrodes connected externally through some sort of load represented by this resistor, and this load can be something like a light, like a light emitting diode. In the salt water, you'll have some sodium ions and chlorine ions, and you'll also have some hydrogen ions and some hydroxide ions. Because of the difference in electrochemical potentials between the zinc and the copper, electrons will want to flow from the zinc to the copper. So that will leave the zinc electrode positively charged and the copper electrode will start to become negatively charged. So at the zinc solution interface what will happen is that zinc ions will enter solution and they will be doubly charged. And the zinc ions will combine with two hydroxide ions to form zinc hydroxide. At the copper solution interface, four electrons from the copper combine with dissolved oxygen molecule in the water plus two water molecules to form four hydroxide ions in the solution. So electrons are flowing from the zinc to the copper electrode, so the actual current flow, which is the flow of positive charge, will be in the opposite direction. So for current to flow, there's going to have to be a DC current to flow, there's going to have to be a continuous current flow through the load into the zinc electrode, through the solution, into the copper electrode, and back into the load. So in the solution, it is the sodium and chlorine ions that are causing the water solution to be conducting. So in solution, sodium ions will flow to the copper, towards the copper electrode, and chlorine ida ions will flow towards the zinc electrode, completing our current flow around our battery. So although the actual charge on the zinc is positive and on the copper is negative, it is the copper that's our positive terminal of our battery and the zinc which is the negative terminal because the electrochemical potential of the copper is at a higher electrochemical potential than that of the zinc. And it's the electrochemical potential that is really driving the current flow in our battery. During operation of the battery, when current is flowing, zinc is entering solution from the zinc electrode. So the zinc electrode is being consumed. So the battery will continue to function to supply a current until the zinc electrode has been totally consumed. Here I have a D cell, which is a zinc 
carbon battery, although it would probably be more proper to refer to it as a zinc manganese battery because the carbon plays no role in the electrochemical reaction that takes place. So if I were to remove the labeling here on the outside of the battery, which I've done on this one, you would see that the outside can here is made of zinc and that functions as one electrode. Down the center is a carbon rod and around that carbon rod is a manganese oxide. So the manganese oxide and the zinc serve as the two electrodes. And in between is a moist paste of ammonium chloride which serves as the electrolyte and that even though this is also called a dry cell that paste needs to remain moist so that ions can flow in the electrolyte. 